Welcome back. This is week 22 of Ready to Homeschool six month countdown. You can get the PDF file for this week on hilarioushomeschooling.com, my blog. Um, the topic for this week is nature study and science. I have a lot to say. It's going to be pretty long. I'll try to tell you when you can take a break if you don't have that much time. All right. Um, this was something that was interesting to me because I did not grow up doing nature study. My mom would take me on walks and I would enjoy hearing what she had to say about the birds and the plants. Um, her mom had taken her on walks when she was a little girl. Her mom had been a botany teacher and a Latin teacher and had all sorts of things to share with her um, in her growing up years. And so I think that influenced my mom to do the same thing with me. But that kind of education is not happening in the public school. In the public school, it's very difficult to take an entire classroom of children outside to see the natural world and observe things that are unpredictable. And so I don't remember going outside except for recess um, during our elementary years. But I think as a homeschool family, you have that luxury. You have the luxury of using some of your homeschool day and its actual authentic learning to be outside in nature and exploring nature and seeing nature firsthand and learning all that you can about observing what God has made. Um, Romans 1, 20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. The more time that you spend in nature, the more your kids ask questions, how did this all get here? And the more you have an opportunity to share with them about our amazing, amazing God, the creator, the one who made all things and made them in such diversity with his power and by his mighty arm. And so one of these things, it, it, Going outside in nature is going to accomplish so many different goals for you. First of all, it's going to help you have a better balance in mental health. Kids being outside generally get along better and enjoy the outdoors. It's going to spark their interest in science. Half of the science topics that I have listed on this page can be met by doing nature study and being outdoors. Third, it's going to raise your awareness of your creator and give you chances to glorify him throughout the day just by seeing something beautiful that he made or watching his awesome power revealed in a hailstorm or other things like that. Don't, don't give up on this amazing opportunity to take your kids outside and enjoy nature together. Um, what, I made, what I did is I made a list of all the different things and categories that I could think of. And I, there's probably more, I probably missed some things, but you can study these things, they're all science. You can't study them all in one year. That would be really, really difficult. I mean, I suppose you could if you just did one or two weeks on each one of them, but it's better to dive into a topic and let your kids learn even more about it and become miniature experts. So I'm just gonna list them really quickly and talk about them a little bit. Um, and then how we can get use the time that we have with them in our home to study science and then give you a whole bunch of resources. So human body systems, health and nutrition. Learning about their own bodies and how they work is very valuable to kids and, and the information will transfer over to other animals as well. Um, learning to eat healthy. Um, this is not something that comes naturally to our kids. And so this is something that you can start informing them about why we choose the foods that we do to eat, what they do for our bodies and how they help us. So that is an excellent, um, valuable study. When they're little, you can't study it as in, dip, in depth as when they're older. But um, one of the fun things to do is just the five senses and give the kids a chance to talk about um, all of the different ways that they take in information. Um, and then, you know, learning a little bit more about where these parts of your body are located and what part of your body is doing 
the digesting of food and what part of your body is pumping the blood. Some kids don't like to learn about all this kind of stuff, but some kids who have medical needs have been to doctor appointments so many times that they understand the human body even better than we did at that age. Um, one thing that is really fun is to buy one of those three-dimensional models um, where you can actually take the insides out of the person and kind of learn more about how your own body is put together. Zoology is the study of animals and insects. And botany is plants, trees, and flowers. If you can get your kids outside doing nature study, you will automatically bump into all of these. The kids will find animals and insects and plants and trees and flowers all around your house. And they'll become more familiar with the ones that are in your neighborhood um, and learn more about what your own particular ecosystem is like. And this is all introductory biology without even calling it introductory biology. Um, then we have geology, which is studying rocks and volcanoes and plate tectonics and all those kind of things. Um, you probably don't have a volcano in your backyard and that's fine, but kids are fascinated with them. So it's a very natural interest to capitalize on. And then rocks, my kids just loved picking up rocks in the driveway and bringing them home and washing them and talking about how they sparkle and why this one's red. And um, So it's very fun to study rocks with kids because that's one of their own natural interests already. I already mentioned the idea of an ecosystem. Um, everywhere that, wherever a person is living, you have your own particular ecosystem that surrounds you. If it's a rainforest or a desert or a beach or here in Iowa, farmland, there are certain creatures and plants that go along with that ecosystem. Where if you went to a different ecosystem, you would find different animals, different plants, um, different trees, different climate maybe. So learning the fact that there are other ecosystems in the world to be aware of, um, and especially if you go on a trip to the zoo, you will find that the zoo is kind of set up for, for each ecosystem. Um, you know, like there's the Arctic area over there and there's the cat house and um, they let other animals live in there that wouldn't be endangered by the big cats. Um, moving on to meteorology, this is basically just watching the weather, and um, this is one of those popular things for kindergartens to do is to sit in a circle and talk about what the weather is outside. You can notice the weather as little kids, but you can take it up a notch every grade level and find out more about um, the clouds, the weather patterns, climate, how hail forms. Those are the kind of things that you can study with your kids and um, help them more be more aware of the kind of weather patterns that you have in your own community. Astronomy, this is the study of outer space, constellations, stars, planets, the solar system. Kids are usually fascinated with this as well. And if you live in an area where you can watch the stars um, late night in August, it's a fun time to watch like the meteor showers and introduce your kids to some of the names of the constellations. Uh, oceanography, limnology, that was a new term for me. Hydrology is the water cycle. Marine science is all the different things that go along with studying the ocean and water, not just creatures, but even like the tides that are governed by the gravity, the moon and the sun. So all of those things you're going to encounter if you go outside. So if you were to draw a line right there, those are all things that you could learn in an average day of taking a walk outside with your kids. Um, you might not be able to cover all of them every day, but you would encounter something from each of those things that you could comment on just walking around your neighborhood or a neighborhood park or somewhere that you as a family like to hike. The rest of the list is something that you kind of have to do a little bit more research for, more book learning, more hands-on experiments, um, or you need special tools. For example, microscopic organisms, you're not going to see without a microscope. You can dip the pond water and take it home, but you're going to need a microscope to look at that and see the microscopic organisms living in the pond water. Um, the study of origins. This is a big one in science, evolution versus creation. Every family has their own take on this. And we're gonna talk about worldview a little bit ne more next week, but I want you to be aware that this worldview colors all science resources. 
If you have invested in science resources already, books that you've brought into your home to help your kids learn more about science, you're going to find that there is um, a group out there who believes that the world is millions of years old um, and that dinosaurs existed before human beings. And then on the other hand, you're going to find young earth creationists who believe that God literally created the earth in six days and that and dinosaurs and humans were created on day six of creation. These are two very opposing worldviews, and they are going to shine through in many of the science curriculum or resources that you purchase. And so I highly recommend that you have a conversation with your kids when this starts to come up. It does not need to be an in-depth conversation. You don't have to throw all the resources in the world at them, but you do have to acknowledge it because there is attention here that um, little kids tend to believe every grown up. Every grown up has been on earth longer than they have, so they must know everything. That feeling goes away by their teenage years, but when they're really little, they're very impressionable and they will believe just about anything a grown up tells them unless they know the grown up's teasing. Well, the grown ups that write these science books are not teasing. This is firmly what they believe. And so you have to present this idea that there are some scientists out there who believe this and some scientists who believe God believe this. And so there is a tension here in what the grown-ups are saying and what the experts have to say that can be an issue for your kids when it comes to doubting their faith. Um, this depends on how much of a bubble you've been able to raise your kids in so far. Um, I'm not saying raising your kids in a bubble is good or bad. That's totally up to each family. But some families, this issue is not encountered until their kids are 10 or 11 years old, depending on what resources there have been available. In some families, this concept is already being talked about when they're four. What that looks like in your family, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that it's going to have to be a conversation that you have at some point with your kids. And I think that if we're pursuing education, we need to give both points of view. Our education is not going to be complete if we only present whatever we believe and never let them find out what other people in the world believe. That's more like indoctrination, where you're giving your kids one point of view and saying, this is what our family believes. Don't argue with me. Don't question me. That's not healthy for education. That's not even in the spirit of science, which is this idea of being curious and asking questions and inquiry and wanting to know more. So in the spirit of science and in the spirit of giving your kids a true education, make sure that you're not presenting everything that you teach them from only one point of view. You can say, this is my point of view and this is how I've arrived at it. But there are other people in the world who believe this and some of their reasons are this, this, and this. Um, I think it's healthy for kids to know that, that grownups disagree as well. Um, I think that's the only way they're going to be able to survive in the world that is heading their way in the next couple decades is to know that grown-ups disagree with each other and there are reasons for those disagreements. So instead of sheltering them and keeping them in a bubble long term, we want to at some point expose this, them to this idea that there is an ongoing debate between evolution and creation and we need, we need to present it well we need to present um, the reasons for why we believe it and against why we believe it. And they will come to their own conclusions, whether you want them to or not, they will come to their own conclusions. And um, we need to make sure that we are giving them the best evidence that we have for our reasons. Okay, moving on, there are simple machines that involve motion, um, force, energy, work, that kind of thing. And along those lines are inventions and in technology, things that have invented in, been invented in the last 100 to 200 years that have made our lives much easier. These kids just take them for granted. They didn't know that there was a time without washing machines and phones and TVs. So helping them understand that these things have developed over time helps them understand that these things are still developing. People are still working on improved technology. Magnets and electricity, um, light and sound energy and heat energy. These all are physics topics that you can introduce your kids to at a young age, but you will probably need some 
um, science equipment to do that. The metric system, which is really a math concept, but because all of science is based, um, all measurement seems to be based in the metric system, you should have your kids learn the metric system before or during ninth grade at least. It'd be best if it could be earlier, but sometimes um, the math that we're already teaching seems to crowd out this idea of teaching the metric system. The scientific method, this is something that kids can understand early on, the idea that we're making a guess and then we're testing it out and then we're coming to a conclusion based on our test. There's a lot of different hands-on experiments that kids can do that will help them understand the scientific method better and those experiments exist in almost every topic that we've been talking about so that they can understand that scientists in every area still use the scientific method to make up new hypotheses, new theories, get new information, um, and that science is always advancing in that way. Along that line is scientific discoveries and theories by famous scientists. Um, there is a quote that says, if I have seen further than others, it is because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. I believe it was said by Newton. I didn't look that up. But this idea that science is continually advancing and we don't have to reinvent the wheel, our kids do not have to discover the law of gravity all on their own. It has already been discovered and so we're going to teach them about that because we want them to be able to take the scientific body of knowledge that already exists and continue to make advancements in their own lifetime. They may not be scientists. They may not make advancements in science in their lifetime. That's okay. What we're saying is they should not be ignorant of the amount of information that's already been discovered and the theories that have already been put forth. Whether they take them and fly with them or not, there's a core amount of knowledge that we just assume that people have when they're educated. So you wanna talk about famous scientists and their life and maybe what some of the influences were or what, why, why they were so curious, what made them so curious to want to do more inventions. Um, or more theories or more discoveries. And there's good books and videos out there about famous scientists that you can find. Um, when they are a little bit older, uh, I mean, you can experiment with states of matter when they're younger, but they don't understand the reasons for the states of matter until they're ready to understand chemistry, the atom, um, atomic and nuclear physics. These are all very advanced concepts, but you wanna make sure that you know where the kids are heading while you're teaching these concepts so that you can kind of help um, lay the groundwork and lay the foundation for what they might go on to learn later. All right, so let's talk about each stage for a few minutes. Um, throughout the preschool years, you wanna keep it light. You don't want to sit down with science textbooks and bore them to death. You don't even need workbooks for science at this stage um, or the next stage either. You want to use as much of your time as possible exploring the outdoors and doing hands-on science experiments with them. <clears throat> they might be a little too young at preschool, but even just the idea of being able, you know, to pour sand into a cup and realize that it overflows, that there wasn't enough space in the cup to hold that sand. That's a scientific observation. That is a physics experiment, a very simple physics experiment, but they're learning the whole time. There are a lot of picture books out there that can introduce science concepts. And those are fun to read with them and kind of starts to wake up that part of their mind. Um, also teach observation skills, help them to slow down and notice things. This is um, very helpful in nature. If they can be still and listen and notice things around them, they will um, be better equipped to learn all the different animals, trees, flowers, and then also model inquiry for them. Um, basically, Make yourself act like a child for a few minutes, not throwing temper tantrums or anything like that. Just simply helping them learn how to ask questions. Like, I wonder why, and then ask the question, you know, like, I wonder why the butterfly is flying that direction, or I wonder why that cloud looks different from that cloud over there, or I wonder why the sky is getting dark. Just helping them start to ask questions in their own mind is helping them to become more of a scientist themselves, following a scientific process of wonder and curiosity that drives them to find out more. Okay, so the early elementary years, you're gonna continue the hands-on exploration and the experiments. 
these hands-on experiments and hands-on exploration is going to be foundational when you do get to books later. Um, you do not want a kid to have to learn about magnets in the seventh grade and never have played with a magnet before in their life. You want to have the foundational experiences of playing with magnets and experimenting with hooking up a battery to a light bulb before they encounter it in a textbook because those hands-on experiments are helping the kids gather their own concepts and learn it firsthand themselves, more of a discovery model than a direct teaching model. And that's very useful in science. Um, like we said, encourage curiosity, um, encourage them to ask questions, encourage them to want to know more and encourage them to look up the answers if they have access to resources that they can do that. Um, help them learn the names of plants and animals, insects, constellations, clouds, Help them learn names for those things. Watch documentaries about famous scientists or physics demonstrations. Sometimes um, a, a great physics demonstration or chemistry demonstration would be too dangerous or expensive to do in your own house, but you can find a video of it online. Have them watch it and ask them what they think about it. Um, just get them get their minds thinking about why something like that would happen. Uh, and also just go ahead and um, learn more about the lives of famous scientists. There are some great books out there that have been written for kids to help them understand how these scientists grew up, what shaped their early years, and why they ended up uh, wanting per to pursue the scientific interests that they had. Sometimes the scientific discoveries that they made aren't going to be understandable until they have more years of science, but they can still learn about the person and why that person um, is famous or has a famous name. You know, a lot of times our scientific things are named after people like Fahrenheit and Celsius and um, there's a whole bunch in the electricity ones like Ohm and Joule. Things that we just take for granted are just standard units of measure now. They were actually named after a person. So learning more about the famous scientist is going to help your kids understand that there's other people out there who were curious and made discoveries and that's actually advanced technology for them. Okay, middle school years, um, later elementary, like fourth, fifth grade up till eighth grade, this is where you can start to do more formal study. Any area that they're interested in, you can dive deeper. You can do a study for one to two months, um, gathering more information about those things, having them read more textbooks, do more experiments, things like that. Um, we talked already about the opposing views that are behind evolution and creation. This is a good time to help them understand more, um, more about that if you haven't done so already. The scientific method can be used for their own science projects. When I was growing up, we did a science fair in sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade where we made a presentation of something that we had done using the scientific method. And so I remember learning a lot about a very specific area of science through doing a science fair project. Um, it's harder to find science fair projects that are for homeschoolers, but you might have one in your area. And if your kid is interested, and I highly recommend that you try it one year and see how it goes. Um, right before adolescence is a really good time to re-examine, re-study health, nutrition, and the understanding of the human body. The kids are getting ready to go through a very drastic change in their own bodies and being able to remember that the human body was designed to go through this stage of adolescence to change their kid body into a grown-up body it's very helpful for them to have um, those concepts re-cemented in their brain that the changes that they're about to face in their body have been designed by God to grow them and to go over health and nutrition again just to help them understand more about taking care of their bodies during this stage. Um, if you have a chance to travel, to go to zoos or planetariums or other areas of the country or world, you'll be able to see other ecosystems firsthand, um, be exposed in planetariums to stars and constellations. Um, this is a good stage for traveling and taking in new information. One of the interesting things that we my son was just doing a research project on nat national parks and somebody on the national park video said that most of the science he ever learned was by talking to a naturalist at a national park. The naturalist who 
was available to answer questions as they came up because he was exploring a national park. So taking your kids on places like that, um, they're going to ask more questions on a trip like that than they are while they're reading a textbook. So provide some opportunities to travel to areas that are unusual, like the Grand Canyon or the Petrified Forest, places where they can see something that's unusual or different from your own backyard. And that will help um, prepare them to study some of these science concepts more in depth as well. You want to aim for a well-rounded science education before they get to high school. Before they reach eighth grade, you should have exposed them at least to every category on this list, except for maybe atomic and nuclear physics. You want them to have some idea of what each of these bodies of scientific knowledge has to offer. Not that they mastered all of it or understand all of it, but they have an exposure to it because when they hit the high school years, it's going to be pressure to perform and pressure to meet expectations and get good grades to go on to college. And they are not going to have the freedom to explore again. So you want to plan for that, especially in their maybe fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade years, those four years right there, to give them more time to explore informally all of these different categories that we've listed. I don't know what that would look like at your home, but um, just kind of thinking intentionally about how you can expose them to all of these different topics that we've talked about at the top of the list. Okay, when they get to high school, um, it is generally expected that student, high school students will take three years of science. Some colleges may even prefer that the student have all four years that they've studied something in science, but most of the time three is adequate. They prefer that one of those years be um, have a lab component. So in biology, that would include several bio, biology experiments as well as some dissections of, um, you know, dead animals like the fetal pig or something like that. Chemistry would uh, want hands-on chemistry experiments. Um, in public schools, it is less and less that they are getting actually exposed to doing the hands-on experiments with chemicals because of safety liability reasons. So you have to decide if you want to do something like that at home. There are more and more online science labs where they can manipulate their mouse that will add the ingredients on the computer screen and do the, pre the predicted result. So if that is something that you want to invest in without having a lot of chemicals around your home, you can go ahead and look at an online science lab for something like that. Um, a physics lab would be something like, um, you know, calculating the speed of something or the force applied to an object or experimenting with cars that are run by mouse traps or things like that. It would be important to learn how to write lab reports for, especially for the class that you decided was going to be your one that had a lab component. So you wanna be able to have a lab notebook um, that they understand the idea of keeping a record of what the equipment was that they found, the procedure that they followed, um, the data that they gathered, and then their conclusion. So it's not necessarily because they are going to make amazing scientific discoveries during this time of their life, most of those prescripted experiments already have outcomes that are predictable, but it's more the idea of the process of learning to keep good records um, as you go further in your science and become a scientist, that you will have good records and good record keeping habits for future um, experiments that don't have predictable outcomes so that other people can follow what you have done and replicate it or judge it or critique it. So this idea of writing lab reports is more important in college, but they should have some exposure to it and practice during high school in doing that as well. Um, and I would caution you that physics, the actual serious study of physics is going to rely heavily on calculus. If your students have not made it to calculus, they can do a watered down version of physics, but they won't be able to understand the in-depth serious study of physics because a lot of it is involving manipulating equations and finding derivatives and things like that. And if they haven't done calculus, they're not gonna be ready to do that kind of math on those calculations. 
Okay, if you need to take a break, this is a good time because I've got a pile of resources to show you next. So, all right. Page one of our resources starts out with Handbook of Nature Studies. I don't have it with me because I loaned it to a friend, but it is about this thick. It was written over a hundred years ago by somebody who wanted to make it easier for public school teachers to incorporate nature study in their classroom without having to do a ton of research on their own. So the idea would be that a one room school teacher is walking to school. She happens to find a dead dragonfly on the road. She picks up the dead dragonfly. She brings it with her to a classroom. She looks in the index of this very thick book and finds out that dragonflies are talked about on page 320. She quickly gets ready to tell her students about it before they walk in the door because this is a, it's a lesson like right there. It's like a teachable moment. Here's a dead dragonfly. Here's what de um, I can tell you about dragonflies because it's all on page 324. Now we have access to a lot more than she did at that time or that one room school teachers would have had at that time. Um, but this is a really great, helpful little volume to help you understand how to put together nature lessons for kids on short notice. And you might end up using it yourself um, if you find a dead dragonfly on the road. So it is in the public domain now. If you don't want to buy your own copy and have it on the shelf, there's a free PDF download um, on the internet that you can find and just have it available if it's something that you're interested in looking at. The next thing is field guides. My mom was the one who encouraged me to get several of these books and keep them around, and I did. And we now have about 20 or 30 of them. And they're on all different topics. They're little pocket-sized guides that you can use to identify all sorts of creatures, rocks, minerals, seashells, trees, flowers, all sorts of things that you would find um, on an everyday nature hike. They're not usually books that you would read straight through. They're just helping you um, find something. So, you know, this is just a quick little book about birds. Um, it's divided up into topics. So like forest and woodland, that would be birds that you might be able to find in a forest and woodland. Um, this one is not as much of an identification as I was thinking it was, but it still gives you some ideas uh, about what to look like, what to look for when you are out bird watching. So little book there. This one is specifically about garden insects. I actually bought it when I was gardening to find out which insects were helpful and which insects were not. Um, but very helpful with color pictures and kind of tells you about where they live. This one is about constellations. Um, and on the back, they have a list of several other books that they have that you could buy. Um, this would be just, you know, if you were looking at the night sky um, and you wanted to know what the constellations were, there's actually an app on your phone now that is more helpful than books to be able to just point it at an area of the sky and that the app tells you what is what constellation you're looking at. Here's a really old one about seashells. So um, if you were going on a beach vacation, you might throw this in and have your kids kind of, you know, identify shells as you're enjoying your vacation. Um, if that feels too academic and forced, then don't do it. I'm just giving you ideas. A fun thing to do if you are serious about nature study is to just put together a little backpack or box that you can keep in your car. Um, several of the field guides that we talked about that might pertain to your area. Um, a couple magnifying cla glasses, one for each kid to have with them. And um, some colored pencils and a piece of paper or little index cards and a little composition journal. You can make your own little package um, your little kit for being ready to go on a nature hike whenever the inspiration strikes. Maybe you're, you know, waiting for an older kid to get done with baseball practice. You can take the younger kid on a little nature hike just in, in town on a, next to a sidewalk. You'd be surprised what you'd find. Um, ants, pine cones, acorns, or up in the sky, clouds, all sorts of things. So um, learn to find little times like that where you can do nature study with your kids even though it's not formal or pre-planned, just little teachable moments that you're ready to go. Um, Dover coloring books. So Dover is a company that has put together quite a few different um, coloring books. Um, we're gonna talk about them again tomorrow, I mean next week when we talk about social studies and history. But I wanted you to know that there's many Dover coloring books that feature 
um, different kinds of birds or butterflies or um, other animals that you might be able to find. And they just kind of give the kids a chance to color a picture. They tell you the right way to color it if you wanted to actually match the bird that is in nature. But if you're not picky and your kid wants to color the duck pink, I mean, okay, I'm not going to be mad about it, but they might have missed out on the point of the lesson. So just know that those are there. Um, Knee High Nature, I didn't find that one, but I've used it before. Uh, I think they're out of print, but you can find them on the secondhand market and they're fun ways to explore nature with your kids. Um, they have one for fall, one for winter, and one called Summer in Alberta, which must be from Canada. So, um, a very fun little book called Play With Me. I highly recommend this if you're trying to teach your preschooler about nature study. This is just a reminder that animals are not gonna come out to see you unless you are sitting very, very still. And then you'd be surprised at what animals um, venture into your territory because they don't know you're there. Um, if you're very excited and you're jumping around and you're trying to get them to play with you, sometimes they go away. So a fun, easy read for little kids to understand more about how to sit still during nature study. Home science tools. This is just an online reference for you. If you are wanting to do experiments or dissection or buy a microscope, this is a great um, company to use. Okay, Magic School Bus. This was out on PBS um, back in the 90s. They have books. They have animated movies. Um, my VHS doesn't work anymore, but I still have this for some reason. You can now find them online, um, even on YouTube. But they are fun little ways to um, talk about different science concepts. I would never use it as the full curriculum necessarily, um, but there are so many little facts uh, sprinkled throughout each page. It's basically the idea is that this is a classroom full of students and they are doing like a research project on something. This one happens to be the solar system. So there's little reports that they've done on the solar system over in the sides, but they all have gone on a field trip in the magic school bus with their crazy teacher, Ms. Frizzle, and they're having an adventure. Um, usually the bus gets, uh, somebody's in trouble, somebody needs saved. There's always, you know, this plot that thickens and everybody's scared. Um, like if there's a giant spider, a lot of times the magic school bus shrinks so that like, you know, the giant spider is much bigger than them. It always ends up all right in the end. And there's always one annoying kid in the class. Um, but they're a really fun introduction, um, usually about half an hour long. Wild Goose Company, I didn't find anything upstairs, but I know I've used them in the past, and these are also out of print, off the market, but you can still find old ones if you wanted to do them. They're just hands-on experiment kits that you can use to explore science. Home Science, home science Adventures. Um, so these come in a kit like this, and they have all sorts of stuff in them that will help you explore. This one is for three different ones. It's for microscopic explorations, insects, and light. And all the little things that you need to do, all the different experiments are included in here, um, including, you know, like giant fake ants where you can talk about the thorax and abdomen and cephalothorax, all those kind of things. Um, and then each kit comes with a set of worksheets that you can then... Um, copy for your own kids and then use as a textbook. There wouldn't be another textbook with this. It would just be a series of worksheets that um, you can use as you're going through and talking about uh, all the different things that they want to teach you. So this one is about birds and it has all sorts of little hands-on activities to do, um, including making a bird feeder, um, identifying birds, and they, it even comes with its own little field guide where you can identify birds. So they only have six kits. I wish that they had gone ahead and made more, but the ones that they have are fabulous. And if you can still order them, um, I would especially recommend them for like your second through fifth grade. Okay, this is called the new, the new way things work. It's filled with drawings about technology, inventions, um, science, 
binoculars, how binoculars work, how microscopes work, how a space probe works, magnetic storage, like your credit card reader. Um, what I really love about this book is the very beginning where they give an overview of all the simple machines. Um, I had to read this to my kids when we did it because they were like early elementary. But the pictures are fantastic and they all include these woolly mammoths who are doing all of these different things um, with like a Stone Age feel to it to show that it's kind of primitive. Simple machines are rather primitive, but they have been used now. The simple machines are put together with other simple machines to make very complicated machinery. And that is what the whole book is about. I would, I, none of us ever read this book entirely straight through, but it was a great resource. And especially that first chapter about simple machines. Uh, Supercharged Science is by Aurora Lipper. Um, we have never paid for her fancy program, but I have done several of her online free videos and they're fantastic. Um, they usually end up being a commercial for her very pricey program, but she's very enthusiastic. She knows her stuff and she comes up with fabulous projects for the kids to do. So um, I would highly recommend that you at least look at what she's offering. If you decide that you don't wanna afford her, you can still homeschool without her, but I will say that it is top of the line. Real Science for Kids. This is a series of books put out by Rebecca Keller. This one is the biology one, level one. She has more that are a little bit more advanced, but she just covers several um, very simple, you know, there's just a little bit of reading and then there's illustrations. This would be metamorphosis of a frog, um, talking a little bit more about the life cycle of a frog. Um, same thing with a butterfly. Ecosystems. So they're very simplified versions of higher level concepts. A lot of times you wouldn't necessarily cover, you know, amoeba and paramecium with little kids, but she makes it understandable in a way that little kids would enjoy and can understand. So this is a good introductory science um, for some of the more advanced concepts that you would be getting into. College Prep Science by Greg Landry. We have used this before. He is a homeschool dad who was a retired science teacher. Um, he has several classes that he does online. And so that's one that our daughter Jessica used two years ago. <clears throat> she did a pre-chemistry class for one semester and then she did a marine science class for one semester. They were all done online. He gave the homework. He told us what book to buy. Um, she did her homework and turned it into him and he would give her a grade. Um, it would be more reading and writing than I was expecting it to be, but she rose to the challenge and took, took care of it. And it would, turned out to be very, very valuable. She really, really enjoyed his live classes. Um, so he also has some in-person science camps. And I think he's going to specialize now in his marine science camp in Alabama each year. So if that's something that interests your kids, it's very expensive, but um, he's got it down to a science. He's got it figured out how he wants to run it and all the different things that they can fit into a week that will get your kid a semester worth of um, credit for high school. Next one is Janice Van Cleve. She has written over 50 books that look like this. They're full of experiments that um, demonstrate scientific principles. She helps them experience the scientific method in action. It's not written like a textbook. It is written like a collection of experiments. So this one is called a compass plant, um, showing that lichen will go onto the north side of a tree. Um, I haven't read this one, so I don't know for sure, but this one is just how to take the ground temperature of your soil. So this is written to the kids um, and it, it's got a little tiny at the bottom. It's got a little tiny Y. This would actually be a good way to learn how to write up a lab report because it almost has it exactly how you'd want to do it. It's got the purpose, the materials, the procedure, the results, and the conclusion. So if you are trying to teach your kids to write a lab report, this would be an excellent model. I would not want them to copy this directly into their, um, into their notebook but to understand that this is how you write a lab report so that they can be um, practicing their science skills. So 
There's a ton of these books and you can find them used if you decide that you want to invest in them. Uh, next is TOPS Learning Systems. These are put together by uh, a science teacher and a graphic designer. They have a lot of books like this too. They were specifically written for public school teachers who do not have access to a lot of resources or money for science equipment, but they um, are great for homeschool families as well. So this one specifically is about radishes, growing radishes and what you can learn by growing radishes. And so they give you a list, like your calendar of what you're gonna do. It's a four week study. You're gonna be doing all of these things Monday through Friday. Um, it's, so it's set up for a public school classroom. You do a lot of copying um, out of their book. They give you permission to copy. And then um, they kind of give you the, what you're supposed to be doing as a teacher. Um, the lesson notes kind of help you as the teacher. This would be the student sheet and this would be your sheet to know what to do for that experiment that day. So excellent series. Uh, there's quite a few of them. Next is One Small Square. This is another series that's really, really good. This helps kids understand ecosystems around the whole globe. So um, I would recommend starting with Backyard, but the one that I found to show you off my shelf was the Tropical Rainforest. So this is just the idea that um, if you were to go to a rainforest and looked at one square, what would you see in it? And so it kind of teaches you the different animals that would live in the rainforest. And you can see that there's some reading to go with each page. Um, very colorful, very fun. I would recommend this for upper elementary, although um, a very interested younger elementary student would listen to you read it and learn more about it. God's Design 4. I did not find this one on my shelf. I used a very old version of this series. So um, they have updated the series since then, and it is now sold by Answers in Genesis and Master Books. <clears throat> it covers every science topic you can think of, and it is written in such a way that you can adapt it up or down. So if you're trying to teach science to a, a wide range of kids, like first grade through eighth grade, you could use this series and all of your kids could be studying the same science at the same time, which I highly recommend, by the way. If you're gonna teach magnetism, you might as well teach magnetism to all the kids. Just simpler books for the younger ones, and more advanced textbooks for the older ones. So this is a great series for um, going through and teaching your kids on all levels because they have experiments and then they have um, ways that you can adapt the instruction. Okay, last page. Inquisit Kids Discover and Do. This is a DVD series that was put out by Sunlight. If you decide to do it now, you're, you're gonna have to use the streaming service that they offer. It actually goes along with their science curriculum for each year. So for example, this one right here, the Discover and Do Level 3, starts with experiments with radishes because they use this book. So these experiments, these people doing these experiments on this DVD are showing you how to do each lesson um, on these books. So it makes it easier for the parent because the parent doesn't necessarily have to supervise all the experiments. The parent can just let the kid watch the experiment and then let the kid do the experiment um, if they're feeling comfortable enough with their child using that kind of equipment. So this, you would still need to supplement it with whatever book Sunlight was using that year. Um, for example, you'd have to go and find this book to go along with the first section of this. But these are really great for parents who um, maybe don't feel confident about science or maybe don't have time to do the experiments. You could still go ahead and have your kids get the benefit of seeing what the experiments were about. Um, so that's why I would put that out there. Exploring the World of by John Hudson Tyner. He has written, and I listed just eight of his books here. He's authored many biographies of famous scientists and a few other science books as well. Um, this I would recommend for probably mm, like seventh to ninth grade. It's short chapters um, and he's got questions at the end to help you think about what you learned. So like a little quiz. Um, so they're not very long and they can kind of stand alone if you want them to. 
I used it more as a supplement. I didn't use it as our main science, but every once in a while we would go and read um, a chapter out of this book. And they're very interesting. They're very, um, I, I mean, I learned stuff because my science background is adequate, but there's a lot of things out there that you could understand at your level and you just don't because you don't have time. So I would recommend the whole entire set, but depending on what you're studying, um, you can pick and choose there. Apologia. Um, this is a high school textbook that Apologia puts out. It's exploring creation with chemistry. And so you can see that it's very in depth, very well done. It's almost 600 pages. Um, and they put these together in modules. So for example, module six is stoichiometry. So depending on how well you remember stoichiometry, uh, I would recommend reading it on your own and then teaching it to your kid. They also do have a video curriculum now that goes with like the third edition. This is the second edition. Um, and so you can pay more money to have somebody else teach it. It is about 30 to 40 pages per module. And then the last page in the module is always practice problems. This comes with a whole kit that has tests and worksheets and extra ways of preparing to make sure that they understand it. This would be advanced level um, high school work. But Apologia also puts out books for younger kids. So this would be exploring creation with astronomy. This would be geared toward like fourth to seventh and eighth grade. So um, these are slightly uh, less intimidating pages and they kind of give background information about the topics. And um, so you can kind of get a feel for what that looks like. These come with something that they call Explorer's Notebooks, where you can get a little three ring, a coil bound notebook that would go along with this and help your kid take notes and answer questions and draw pictures with it. Um, the last one on there, I do not, I did not bring down with me. It's called the 101 series. And basically this guy named Wes Olson decided that he was gonna put together a curriculum that was all on video. Um, and it's very well done. It's easy to watch. The problem is, is that the DVDs, if you watched all of them back to back, are anywhere from four to 11 hours. And he says that it covers an entire year's worth of topics. Well, if you're gonna do an entire year of high school, that should equal about 120 hours uh, in real time. So watching a four hour DVD series isn't going to even come close to finishing an entire year's worth, the equivalent of a year's worth. Um, for example, if you have a student who did this right here for their chemistry class, um, 600 pages of chemistry, including 30 pages of stoichiometry, and then you compared it with Wes Olson's Chemistry 101, which is approximately maybe eight hours long, you can see that there's a vast difference between what these two company, companies are offering you. So I want to let you know that each one of his DVD discs at the very end has a file that is a PDF document that you can print out of your computer. And in that PDF document, he tells you how to beef up the class. If your child just wants to watch the videos and they're not in high school yet, that's fine. That's a really good way to solidify some of that science information in their mind. But if they are in high school and all they wanna do is watch the videos, you can't really count that as a high school class. You really need to beef it up with some more experiments or some more supplemental material, some field trips, some outside reading. Um, and he tells you how to do that in those PDF documents. He gives you um, some quizzes that they can take based on his B, uh, DVDs. Um, he just kind of shows you how you can make it, not just the six to eight hours that are on his DVDs, but how to make it an entire high school year's course um, using his information. So all of these things that I've told you about, I have used personally um, and can recommend. There is a whole bunch more science curriculum out there. So just because I didn't list it doesn't mean it's not good. It just means that these are the ones that I was familiar with and that I can recommend to you. And, and I hope that you can find it useful. Um, science is a lot of fun. I really believe that kids need to do as much hands-on as possible in the early years to really get the full benefit of a science curriculum. Um, 
And don't be afraid to say, I don't know the answer to that, because then you are also being a scientist, being able to say, I don't know, but let's find out. If you have somebody who is in your church or in your community that has a high level of science knowledge, don't be afraid to call them and ask them once in a while. Hey, I've got a random question. My kid asked me this and I just really don't know the answer. They will either give you an explanation from their own understanding of it, or they may know of a resource that they have or can point you to that will get you more information. Some of the places that we were talking about, um, Greg Landry and um, Aurora Lipper, the Supercharged Science, they welcome kids to contact them with questions because they know that as you study science, it often produces even more questions. And that's what they welcome. They want that spirit of inquiry in the kids to stay alive um, and to produce more science minds for our world in the future. Okay, for week 24, we're gonna be discussing Teaching from Rest by Sarah McKenzie. I hope you can join me for that. That's just in two more weeks. So thank you everybody. Have a great day.